inclusion rounds of 2021. Inclusion rounds will be happening periodically through the year and will be a forum for us in the department to come together to have conversations to advance inclusion, diversity, and equity. So as a reminder to you all, you all saw the uh, recording announcement come up. We're only going to record the first part of the session, the didactic, and not the discussions afterwards. Uh, so without further ado, today we are delighted to introduce our colleague, Dr. Joy Wu, who will moderate today's session and introduce our speaker. Thank you, Wendy and Tamara, for the introduction. I also want to thank the Department of Medicine, Diversity and Inclusion Council for organizing these inclusion rounds. That's a wonderful opportunity for us all to reflect on how we can support diversity in all its facets within the department. It is my privilege today to moderate our first inclusion rounds on empowering Asian Americans in healthcare. As you know, over the past year, there's been a sharp increase in hate incidents directed towards Asian Americans, including vicious attacks on Asian American elders in many cities, and the recent murders of six Asian women in Atlanta and four sick Americans in Indianapolis. As we'll learn today, Asian anti-Asian American and Pacific Islander racism has a long and unfortunate history. And the reality is that anti-AAPI racism is pervasive, even within medicine. Next slide, please. So what can we do to empower AAPIs in healthcare? Today's program is a first step in that direction. Our objectives are to empower people to recognize anti-Asian racism, to help appreciate the diversity within the AAPI community, to raise awareness of the long history of anti-Asian sentiment in the US, to debunk the model minority myth, and to equip attendees with resources to be an upstander. Our session format for today is that we'll start with a presentation by Dr. Jennifer Young, then break into small groups for facilitated discussions, and finally return at the end to share themes that emerge from these discussions and for further Q&A with Dr. Young. Next slide, please. Before I introduce our featured speaker, a few gr ground rules here highlighted by the acronym GROWS. G is to gain understanding. We ask that you take responsibility for your own learning and clarify your understanding with questions. R is for respect, for different viewpoints and for confidentiality. What is said stays here while what is learned leaves here. O is for openness to exploring new ideas. W is a reminder to watch nonverbals and use your active listening skills. And finally, the AAPI community community is a mix of many different histories, languages, and experiences. No one can speak for all AAPIs, so S is a reminder to speak from your own experience with I and me statements. And with that, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce our fe featured speaker today, Dr. Jennifer Young. Dr. Young is a clinically trained family therapist and a postdoctoral fellow at the Stanford Center for Biomedical Ethics. Dr. Young holds an MA in East Asian Languages and literature from The Ohio State University, and an MS in Couples and Family Therapy from the University of Maryland. In 2018, she received her PhD from the Department of Family Science at the University of Maryland's School of Public Health. Dr. Young has published her work on racial socialization practices in Asian American families, decolonization of mental health approaches, and genetic healthcare access issues for Asian Americans. Her talk today is entitled Empowering Asian Americans in Healthcare. Dr. Young, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Joy, and thank you everyone for having me here today. So I just wanna start off by saying we are all a work in progress. I am by no means an expert on everything that we're gonna be talking about today. Um, I am a biracial Asian American. My mom is an immigrant from China. My father's an immigrant from England. Um, and I'm also a white presenting Asian American as well. So my experiences really differ from other people who identify as Asian American. With this discussion today, I hope to shine a light on the diverse histories, cultures, and experiences of Asian Americans. But again, by no means is this meant to be exhaustive or representative of all people who identify as Asian American. Brief outline, um, we're gonna be covering a lot in a short amount of time. I'm gonna quickly define some terms, uh, talk about two narratives of Asian American history, discuss some stereotypes and microaggressions that relate to Asian Americans, and talk about specifically patient and provider experiences in our healthcare systems. 
we're going to end up with um, some strategies for what you can do, and then we're going to break into our small breakout rooms. So the first term, the one that brought us all here today, Asian Americans, what does this mean? Asian American is a pan-ethnic identity under which people from many different subgroups choose to unite. Um, and together, uh, when using this term Asian American, um, Asian Americans have been able to gain greater political power under this shared identity. Uh, this term was popularized in the 1960s as second and third generation Asian Americans emerged. Um, it also coincided with the development of the Asian American movement, um, which was started by students on college campuses, largely in San Francisco, LA, and New York, including folks at SF State and Berkeley, to advocate for starting ethnic studies departments. Um, and this term, again, it's starting to strengthen the voice of Asians through a shared identity. I will say that this term is a chosen identity. It is not representative, it is not exhaustive. And an example of this is when you Google the term Asian American and the definition, it actually points to an American who is of Asian parentheses, in particular East Asian descent. And so uh, that's something that I have found in my research um, that there are many folks who would fall under the traditional definition of Asian American, but don't say that that is the first way that they identify. Some of them say they uh, identify first with their country of origin, um, their ethnicity or um, their religion maybe. And so we just need to be uh, using the terminology that people prefer. Asia is the largest continent in the world. It has um, 50 different countries and even more subpopulations. Um, there's a really diverse array of ethnicities, cultures, values, and life experiences. And the immigrants and refugees who've come to the U.S. have brought with them a really heterogeneous nature, um, which I think is often overlooked when people think of Asian Americans. So here we have the breakdown of the largest um, origin groups that make up 85% of all Asian Americans. And then there's this 15% um, of the rest of Asian Americans that can be broken down into many different sub-ethnicities. And something um, that I think is important as someone who is biracial is that there's a large proportion of the all others who identify as other Asian um, on, and a large majority of um, Asian Americans are multiracial as well. So it's kind of a difficult uh, uh, population to capture. Here, I just wanna point out that Asian American identity is intersectional. Um, we really need to think about um, how race intersects with identity, intersects with religion, intersects with um, disability and uh, um, immigration status. And so here I just really wanna point out that we have um, black and brown Asians, we have native and Latinx Asians, queer, trans -abled, disabled, and undocumented Asians, as well as folks who are economically disadvantaged. Also, if you don't know some of these faces, these are all folks who um, are kind of popular in American, Asian American culture. So uh, you can feel free to ask me later on about who some of these people are. I'm gonna quickly go through this slide. The main thing I wanna point out here is the term Pacific Islander, AAPI. Um, you know, this, this month is AAPI Awareness Month and um, so I just wanna say that this term, um, it is uh, meant to capture any person who has ancestry from the Pacific Islands, especially native Hawaiians or indigenous groups from Polynesia, Micronesia, or Melanesia. Um, there has been a push from some Pacific Islander um, folks and leaders in the uh, movement that um, they kind of want to move away from categorizing Pacific Islanders together with Asian Americans, again, for the same issue of heterogeneity. Um, Pacific Islanders are faced with different kinds of challenges than other Asian Americans, um, mainly related to decolonization. Um, and so they say that it's time to disaggregate PI from the AA. All right, and I'm gonna jump into some uh, history now. The first story I'm gonna tell is one of history of discrimination and um, sadly violence. Um, so here are some uh, pieces of our history that are a little bit hard to talk about, a little bit hard for me to, to talk about, but 
I think are important to remember. Um, so in our history books, we often hear that the Asian immigrants were a big part of building the inter Intercontinental Railroad, but they don't talk about how many of those immigrants died building that railroad. Um, one of the largest lynchings in American history was of Chinese people. Um, there was a lot of uh, uh, attacks uh, against Chinatowns and Chinese cities um, up and down the California coast in response to the downturn in the 1870s. Um, and that also resulted in the Chinese Exclusion Act, which banned immigration of Chinese laborers until 1943. Um, they were banned for 60 years from immigrating, but immigrants were still coming. And you can see evidence of um, these immigration stories during that time right here in the Bay Area. Angel Island was actually the site of a large immigration detention center where immigrants were detained for months. And I highly recommend going to checking to check out the um, the old detention center um, building. They do really wonderful tours there. And then of course we have um, Japanese Americans lands and shops were stolen when they suffered and died in internment camps after World War II. 1982, um, Vincent Chin was beaten to death in Detroit by white men who blamed him for the loss of American auto industry jobs. He was mistaken for a Japanese American. Um, and post 9-11, there have been countless attacks on South Asians and Muslim folk, including a massacre at a Sikh temple. And then most recently, um, you know, we've become more and more aware and the media has been covering the hate incidents towards Asian Americans, um, which as of March uh, reported a 150% increase from the previous year. But now from March until just May 6th, I believe they had their most recent report, that number is up um, up to 6,603. So really a sharp increase. Um, I do wanna say that I have a friend in the East Bay who was actually kicked in broad daylight um, and just because she uh, appeared Asian. Um, and uh, Joy mentioned the Atlanta area day spa shootings and the FedEx facility uh, shooting in Indianapolis as well. But I don't want to just focus on the negative um, parts of our Asian American history. You know, Asian Americans have sometimes been portrayed as silent or fear fearful of speaking up, but there's actually a strong history of activism and political protest. So inspired by the Black Power Movement in the 1960s, Asian Americans fought for the development of ethnic studies programs and end of the Vietnam War and reparations for those Japanese Americans who were forced into internment camps during World War II. Um, Representative Patsy Takamoto Mink of Hawaii, this is such an impressive person. She was rejected from more than a dozen medical schools because she was a woman and then faced discrimination as a practicing lawyer. So she devoted her life to advocating for gender equality and educational reform. And she was a major player in passing Title IX, the civil rights law that was passed in 1972. And actually in 2002, Title IX was renamed the Patsy T. Mink Equal Opportunity and Education Act. Then we have Larry, Larry Itleong who convinced 2000 Filipino farm workers to walk away from their jobs at California Vineyards and began the famous Delano Grape Strike. Um, he was a labor leader and also a co-founder of United Farm Workers together with Cesar Chavez and a lifelong fighter for the Farm Workers Union. The, the Delano Grape Strike lasted for five years and it actually ended in a pay increase for workers, medical insurance plan and established controls over pesticides. All right, now, um, just as we need to re-examine our historical depictions of Asian Americans, we also need to redefine what it means to be Asian American in our current society. And I wanna start with a well-known myth, and that's the model minority myth. And this is, this is the stereotype that all Asian Americans are healthy, they're wealthy, and they're wise, so they have high educational attainment. And the problem with, there's multiple problems with this myth. One is that it holds Asian Americans up to the standard. And this myth was actually developed around the same time that the yellow and black power movements were getting started. 
in response to the Black Power movements pointing out structural racism and structural inequities. And um, there were folks who created this, this kind of propping up of Asian Americans to say, if this minority can do it, why can't other minorities do it? Um, and so this really serves to pit uh, different racial minorities against each other. And it's really just a tool of white supremacy um, to spread falsehoods. I think um, the other issue with the model minority myth is that it lumps Asian Americans all together and does not acknowledge that there are very different experiences educationally, um, financially across different subgroups. And so there's really been a movement to try to break down this stereotype and say that the model minority does not define who I am. This is not who I am and I don't fit neatly into this package that you want me to. I wanna break down that myth um, in the context of our healthcare system. Um, and here, I'm just gonna talk about some health disparities that exist across different Asian American subgroups. So Asian Americans do contend with numerous factors that may threaten their health, such as infrequent medical visits, some language barriers, or lack of health insurance. But when you look more closely at subgroups, you'll see that Cambodians and Vietnamese are three times more likely to skip doctor's visits due, due to cost compared to all Asians or US residents. One of the highest risk groups for breast cancer is US born Vietnamese women who are at four times greater risk of dying of breast cancer than any other Asian American or Pacific Islander group. US Filipinos have a higher prevalence of being obese or overweight and having high blood pressure, diabetes, or asthma compared with non-Hispanic whites. And in New York, when you look at the general prevalence of smoking, it's 18.6% in white and 14.1% in Asian Americans. So it seems lower in Asian Americans, but when you disaggregate the data by Asian subgroup, you'll see that the prevalence of smoking in Korean Americans is actually 35.5%. And this disaggregation of data is also important in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, Together with uh, Dr. Mildred Cho, I published this commentary um, on a report that was discussing uh, structural racism in the pandemic, and it didn't mention Asian Americans at all. Um, and we wanted to point to how invisible Asian Americans have been in uh, the reporting of COVID-19 data and relief efforts. Um, the first study that came out um, to offer disaggregated data about Asian Americans in New York City showed that Chinese New Yorkers had higher COVID de death rates than any other racial group at 37%, and South Asians in the city have had the second highest rate of test positivity behind Hispanics. And then some of us may have heard um, about uh, Filipino nurses and disparities in COVID-19 related deaths. Um, so even though uh, Filipino nurses only make up about 4% of the nursing population nationwide. They represent a third of the nurses who have died from COVID-19. And there's a great podcast on the experiment that talks about this phenomenon and the immigration experiences of these nurses. And, you know, we've also seen a lot of COVID-19 discrimination. Um, from the reports, this has really been directed strongly at Chinese Americans um, and East Asian Americans. Um, but it's resulted in fear of leaving the house to um, get services. And especially for older Asian populations um, in, in San Francisco in particular, there was a fear of discrimination. And because of sheltering in place, they um, really didn't seek out healthcare services for their COVID-19 symptoms. They didn't get testing. And they also didn't go to seek healthcare when um, they needed to for their pre-existing health conditions. And there's actually reports that people have died um, from this. Some of the other microaggressions that you commonly see um, towards Asian Americans um, is the, where are you from? No, where are you really from? That, that idea that Asian Americans will never actually belong in the United States, that they're perpetual foreigners. Um, the invisibility, you know, my, my commentary was titled The Invisibility of Asian Americans. Um, Asian Americans are often omitted from conversations on race and racism. I think that's um, both, uh, uh, there's blame on both sides. Asian Americans sometimes don't stand up and um, take part in those conversations, but also aren't included. Um, and then there's in general, uh, a second class citizen phenomenon in which people of color receive substandard service when compared to their white counterparts. And 
I just want to share one study that did telephone interviews to um, 3,000 white patients and 500 Asian Americans, and they found that compared to white patients, Asian American patients were less likely to report that the provider talked to them about lifestyle or mental health issues. They were more likely to report that their primary care provider did not understand their background and values. They were more likely to report that providers didn't want to listen, spend as much time, or involve them in decisions about care as much as they wanted, and they were overall less satisfied with their care. I've talked about Asian American patients, but I think that bias and discrimination also affects providers in um, our healthcare system. And uh, one of the things that you may have heard of is the glass ceiling that women face in promotion and obtaining leadership positions. Um, well, when it comes to Asian Americans, there's something called the bamboo ceiling. Um, and Asian Americans have reported discrimination in the workplace ex at extremely high levels. Um, there's also this kind of perception that's been reported of um, employees of East Asian descent being stereotyped as high in competence, but low in worth and dominance, and that they make uh, their less ideal candidates for leadership positions um, better suited for technical competence positions, but not qualified to be managers. <clears throat> in medicine, we focus a lot on underrepresented um, or underserved minorities. And the way that some of our federal institutions define underrepresented or underserved minorities excludes Asian Americans as a group because we've been considered overrepresented sometimes. Um, so, you know, in medicine, uh, for example, anesthesiologists, 15 to 19% of anesthesiologists identify as Asian. 21% um, of medical school applicants identify as Asian. Um, but that is when you break it down again, comprised of three predominant ethnicities, Indian, Chinese, and Korean. When you look at applicants who identify as Thai, Hmong, or Burmese, they're not even listed. That's how few people are applying to medical school. And only 1.8% of Asian medical school applicants are Laotian, Cambodian, Indonesian, or Japanese. So what can you do? The New England Journal of Medicine came out with this perspective piece recently, and I, I just pulled out a couple of things that I felt were kind of useful. Um, one is to uh, address anti-Asian hate and violence with your patients. You know, um, normalize talking about whether they feel safe in their home, in their neighborhoods, or on public transit. Um, you can do screening for depression, anxiety, or substance use associated with racism. Um, and also, I think that special consideration should be given to patients' age. So screen for elder abuse um, or that kind of racism. We found that a lot of older folks have been targets of this violence and potential bullying um, for children, either in person or online. Things that you can do, there is um, multiple funds set up for victims and families of the two shootings that have happened this year. Um, you can report hate incidents to stop AAPI hate. You can join a bystander intervention training. I think this one's really important because one of the most heartbreaking thing that I have experienced watching some of the videos um, of attacks towards Asian Americans is that people stand by and don't stop the per perpetrator. They, they don't intervene. And we need to, whether it's a physical assault or a microaggression, we need to learn how to stand up and speak up when uh, that kind of hate is happening. And lastly, actively listen to and support your AAPI colleagues. I also wanna say that activism and change can start on a really small scale. Um, I did a study uh, interviewing Asian American college students uh, in 2016 about how they perceived Asian Americans to be a part of or involved in the hashtag Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and they said that in their homes with their families, their parents didn't talk about it. Um, they held uh, some racist ideas that um, those college students felt really uncomfortable with and that the college students really felt that they had the responsibility to educate um, the older generation of Asian Americans. But in general, we found that race was not talked about at home. And I really, really hope that is something that we can change. <clears throat>
And related to the stereotypes and the biases that I pointed out earlier, you know, there are wonderful implicit bias trainings, but, you know, you could take some of this um, that I have on the screen here about seeing people as unique individuals, trying not to stereotype, working on consciously changing those ideas that you have about folks, um, taking time to pause and reflect, reduce your reactions, adjust your perspectives, see from another point of view, and try to increase your exposure to folks who are different from you or have different viewpoints. Uh, I want to share a couple of resources here. Um, Asians, Amer Asian Americans in Advancing Justice, I think this is actually now called the um, Asian Americans Victory Alliance, um, and the Asian Pacific American Advocates, they do great policy work. Um, and then for some mental health services to so the Asian counseling referral system. If you want to educate yourself a little bit more, there's tons of great stuff. I recently watched something on YouTube by the Try Guys. Um, Eugene Lee Kim did a wonderful um, hour long educational video on YouTube that um, I learned so much from. Um, but the Smithsonian also um, has a specific Asian Pacific American Center, and they have some really wonderful educational resources. And then PBS also did a, a five hour film series about the history of Asian American identities, contributions and challenges. Lastly, these are my references. And then I'm going to hand it back over to Joy. Thank you all. I think you need to turn on your microphone. All right, there we go. Uh, thank you, Jennifer, Jenny, for that uh, wonderful presentation. You've really given us a lot to think about. Uh, so now we're going to break into small groups uh, for about 15 minutes of discussion. Uh, we are going to use um, a platform called Padlet, Padlet, which I'm putting now into the chat, um, but we'll also have them available uh, in your small group discussion. And uh, also the ground rule reminders are back up. And so each group will have um, a facilitator or you can designate a scribe uh, to discuss some of these issues in more detail. And uh, the Padlet function allows you to answer some of the questions, but also to vote up um, comments, suggestions, questions that you might, um, that might resonate with you. Uh, and in the um, last 15 minutes, we'll come back together as a group uh, to both review the comments that have come through Padlet um, and also to have a Q&A session with uh, Jenny. And so with that, um, Lisa Marie, are you going to split us into our small groups? Um, yes, I am. Oh, thank you.